questions from last time? Anything at all? All right, so we're going to finish up our material here today for the oncology stuff, and then the test is good to go, basically, from there. Our last session will be just review, which I think is later on this week, and then your test is Monday, right? Good. Um, test is pretty well evenly distributed, so we had cardio three, four, parts three and four. We have derm, a palm, and then oncology, right? So it's a lot of stuff, but it's pretty well evenly distributed um, as far as percentages go. So again, everything is, is fair game. The cardio stuff is good, though, because you've had it several times now. This is very similar. All the drugs are pretty much the same. I think the only new ones are like the nitrates and the antiarrhythmics. So we're good from that standpoint. This will probably be the, the biggest uh, influx of new drugs maybe you haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Because if you started oncology... Right, so this will be all kind of new stuff, but um, you know, once you start hitting that in, in CMS, it'll make more, more sense. It'll, sometimes it's good to have the drugs beforehand so you can at least kind of reference back to them. Anywho, so getting started, uh, one thing I also posted up, which I don't know if I mentioned, uh, is my good friend, Mr. Chemo Man, uh, or Chemomen, if you if you prefer. Um, Continue Plastic Man's another name for him as well, but. Um, this is a helpful tool, and you'll probably see this in the oncology course in CMS as well. Uh, going over common adverse effects from pretty traditional sorts of, of chemotherapy you're going to be receiving, right? And so it looks a little silly, but once you kind of learn about the, the adverse effects, and again, just like we saw with antibiotics, that, you know, each of them have a little special flavor to them, you know, things like QTC prolongation or SIP inhibition, things like that. Like, you'll kind of make these associations. And this is a helpful guide for some people who are a little bit more visual learners. So, for instance, if you're looking at something like busulfan, Busulfan causes pulmonary fibrosis, and you see a big B right here for the lungs, right? Or for instance, actually I was dealing with this yesterday, I have a patient who uh, was receiving the drug irinotecan, causes very significant diarrhea. And if you'll see here, um, irinotecan is part of the kind of the guts here, it's a five, uh, this goes with another drug. This will make more sense a little bit later, but uh, this causes a very significant diarrhea. And so we actually had to pre-medicate with certain medications in order to counteract that diarrhea. Um, so again, you'll review that. If there's a drug on here that I don't really talk about very much, don't worry about it. I'm not going to cover that, but this can be useful for just kind of remembering some of these more common adverse side effects. Okay. Getting back into the different drug classes we're going to be covering here. So again, why do I put up the cell cycle? Why does this matter? Because cancer is what? Unchecked cell growth, right? We're having these cells replicating, so it's important to know the cell cycle because this is where all of our drugs are going to be working. If I inhibit the cancer cells from growing, guess what? You arrest the cancer, right? You basically are making it so it cannot grow any further. This is how our chemotherapy is going to be, be working, right? So if you can't cut it out, if you can't use radiation, chemotherapy is there to help out in trying to target these cells. Now, again, are only cancer cells actively in the cell cycle? No, a lot of healthy cells are as well, and that's where a lot of the side effects are going to come from that we're going to see in just a few minutes here. So go back and, and kind of review this once we cover the different drug classes to see where these are going to be working. This is really actually important in some cases because you can only time certain drugs when you think that these cells are actually going to be in a particular growth fraction, right? So and we said once you get, uh, say, like a tumor size gets big enough, what kind of happens to the growth? Kind of plateaus out, right? Because again, you're going to find that you kind of outstrip the the nutrient supply, things like that. Um, you're going to find that typically that thing will flatten out. But if I were to say we're to cut out that tumor, only have say a few cells left over, what does that growth fraction do? It goes up pretty significantly, right? Because now these cells have a lot less competition in in terms of other uh, you know uh, cancer cells. They can start to grow again. And you're going to find they have a, a lot more of them are going to be in that rapid replication sort of phase there. So, for instance, we're looking at this, um, we can see things like, you know, what's happening during the S phase of the cell cycle? Synthesis of DNA, right? That's where we're actually duplicating our DNA. You guys remember that way back in physiology. It might have been the first lecture we covered, right? The cell cycle. Um Go back and review that stuff because like the S phase, we're actually duplicating the DNA. And that's important because if I can halt that, then the cells don't have anything to replicate with, right? They don't have any kind of blueprints in order to make a new cell. So it can be really important there. Um, you're going to find that some drugs as well are also going to be cell cycle non-specific. So we'll kind of go over those and we'll kind of key into different ones, which may be more cell cycle specific, which ones are going to be non-specific, right? Um, and again, that may go in, and speak to some of the adverse effects as well that we're going to see in just a little bit. Anyway. So as I mentioned, with mitosis, usually about a 30 to 60 minute period there, usually G0, a lot of normal, healthy, resting cells are not actively dividing. That's that G0 phase. They're just kind of cooking. They're just kind of doing their thing. No problems there. Um, remember the S phase where DNA synthesis is going to occur. 
G1s where you're going to have this kind of pre mitotic or I'm sorry, post mitotic phase where you're going to have uh, also enzyme synthesis, proteins, things like that. Um, G2 is that pre mitotic phase. Also, we're getting a lot of RNA synthesis here. As I mentioned, um, a lot of your non-malignant cells are going to be in G0. Most of the rapidly dividing cancer cells are going to be in one of these phases here, right? Because, again, as soon as they get done with mitosis, guess what? You know, right back into mitosis again and continue uh, dividing there. Um, and as I mentioned, with a lot of these anti-cancer drugs that they selective for just the cancer cells, a lot of traditional drugs are not. That's why you're going to find that these are going to be affecting other rapidly dividing cells as well. So, for instance, where else might you find rapidly dividing cells in your body right now, assuming you have no cancer? GI tract, right? So GI side effects are huge here, right? You know, all that nice GI epithelia and mucosa are going to be normally rapidly dividing. If you lose that, what could happen? Mucositis, absolutely, right? Mucositis is huge, and you as a dietitian know that a lot. I'm sure, did you ever deal with cancer patients? With them? Yeah, all the time, right? So again, um, nutrition can be a big issue with those patients because if they just, if it's so painful to eat, you know, you might have to find alternative routes. That's why we, sometimes our patients have to go on total parenteral nutrition to supplement that, right? Um, where else might you find these rapidly dividing cells? The hair, right? So alopecia is a common side effect with this. Where else? How about your ability to fight off infection? The white blood cells are constantly dividing as well, right? So, again, if you inhibit that, what happens? You develop neutropenia. You can't fight off infection. Thereby, you get these secondary uh, uh, infections that happen here, right? And, again, as I mentioned, that's oftentimes what kills off these patients. It's not necessarily the cancer itself, but oftentimes the secondary infections they get. Um, some of it's iatrogenic. Some of it's things we're doing to suppress their immune system. For instance, like leukemia. Guess what? That's their main issue is their white blood cells are rapidly dividing. So we got to tamp that down. We have to really knock down their immune system and hopefully give them other things to help hopefully prevent an infection from occurring there. But that can be a big problem. Um, so as I mentioned, that growth fraction, just that percentage of cells are actively dividing at any given time. Uh, and then also things like, you know, S fraction, that's going to be that percentage of cells that are actively rep replicating their DNA. And again, some drugs are going to be very specific for that phase there. Um, the higher that percentage, typically the more aggressive the tumor is. And then as far as the doubling time goes, typically the shorter the doubling time, kind of the more aggressive the tumor is, the more um, rapidly it's going to be dividing there. Okay, so looking at how we actually treat these uh, cancers, um, we're going to find there's several different kind of or different um, kind of uh, strategies we're going to be using here. So, for instance, using combination therapy, very rarely do you find patients are going to be receiving just one type of chemotherapeutic drug. Oftentimes, it's going to be multiples. Why do you think we do that? Additional synergy, right? So we can attack multiple mechanisms. We can get better kills than just with either one alone, right? Just like sometimes we use two different antibiotics with different mechanisms. Um, this can help, sometimes help to reduce resistance. Now, do cancer cells become resistant? Absolutely, just like just like bacterial cells do, right? Um, you can find resistance to certain chemotherapy that drugs will occur over time where they, they will become less and less effective. This can be overcome by using combination uh, combinations of drugs. And then also minimizing toxicity is a big effect here as well. So we can use lower doses of either two drugs. Sometimes that can help them minimize those toxicities there, okay? Um, there's also going to be a lot of other drugs they need to be on that are not used to specifically treat the cancer. These are called adjuvant therapies. And these are trying to either treat the toxicities or try to minimize them. So, for instance, I mentioned that one patient was getting arenatecan, was having very severe diarrhea. We gave them a drug called loperamide to help to basically slow down peristalsis and slow down that GI tract, right? That's an adjuvant type of drug. Um, a big side effect from all these chemotherapy drugs is what? Nausea vomiting, right? So, again, chemo-induced nausea vomiting is a huge, huge thing. We have so many different drugs. We'll talk a lot about those during the GI section uh, in Farm 2. But just keep in mind, this is a big thing we have to worry about as well. And again, think about it. Who likes to throw up? Anyone like have a particular love of throwing up? No, it's like one of the worst things ever, right? Kyle, maybe you should get checked out for bulimia. Um, but um, but it's one of those things where it's just like, you know, just that feeling of being nauseous is like the worst thing, one of the worst things in the world, right? So imagine if you said, okay, well, every week you're going to have to come into this infusion center. We're going to give you something to make you feel that way every time you're not going to feel too good about it, right? And sometimes they even get what we call anticipatory nausea and vomiting, where just even that that knowing that it's coming can sometimes make them very nauseous. And we have different medications we use for that than just specifically due to the actual drugs themselves, right? So there's a lot of kind of facets here. They're very, um, very uh, important to kind of manage all aspects here. Other things as well, we can give them things like colony stimulating factors that helps uh, stimulate the bone marrow so that way they can help to replenish their white blood cells or replenish their, their red blood cells to try to get their, um, their levels back up. Oftentimes you're going to have chemotherapy regimens are going to be what we call count dependent. Can you think of what that means? 
Yeah, you're looking at things like the neutrophil counts, one of the big ones. We also look at platelets a lot. And basically, patients have to meet certain criteria, certain blood level counts of their different cells before we can actually continue giving chemotherapy. If we come, they come back into the infusion center, they're getting labs done, and their you know neutrophils are say 10. Their absolute neutrophil count is 10. It's very low. Like we don't want to give them any more chemotherapy because guess what? They're going to be even at more risk for infection, right? If their platelets are too low, right? It's another rapidly dividing set of cells there. What do you think could happen? Bleeding risk is going to be a big thing, right? So again, these are all things they uh, have to consider. Certain regimens are going to be count dependent. They have to meet certain counts before they can receive any more chemotherapy. What could be a problem if you have to delay chemotherapy because their <laughs> immune system is not coming back? Cancer is going to keep growing, right? So again, this can be a big problem for those patients. You can delay chemotherapy, maybe delaying them actually reaching that, that final cure rate, right? Or kind of cure state, I should say. So um, as I mentioned, timing can be very important. You want to, again, shoot for, um, especially if you're using cell cycle specific drugs, you want to shoot for that particular phase. So if a lot of them are in the S phase, you want to be able to target that S phase, right? If they're in the actual M phase, what's happening during the M phase? You guys remember? That's actual mitosis that's occurring there, right? So if I can if I can affect that, if I can halt that, then I can prevent the new cells from being being produced there, right? Um, and as I mentioned, some will be non-cell cycle specific, but typically chemotherapy is given in cycles. And why do we give it in multiple cycles? Because like with antibiotics, do I have to give multiple cycles of antibiotics? I give you moxicillin. Guess what? You're going to clear that your infection. No problem. You're done at that point, right? However, these cancer cells, you have to get every single cell, even one cell left over can still become cancers, right? So this is where you have to make sure that you have to give multiple cycles. You're going to knock down those cancer cells. You're going to get some healthy cells as well. Get the patient time to reconstitute themselves, and then you're going to do it again and try to get as many of those cells as possible there, right? So that's the biggest thing. Um, so again, a lot of that is... Um, also built in time for them to try to recover. Um, but again, you have to hit those multiple cycles to get all those cells there. Uh, a lot of this is determined by clinical trials, right? So again, is it ethical if I were to say, have a bunch of patients with chemo, or I'm sorry, with, uh, with cancer, and so I'm gonna give half of you no drug whatsoever, I'm gonna give half of you chemotherapy. Not really, that's not really ethical, right? Because again, if I know it's gonna be a problem if I don't treat their cancer. So a lot of times we have clinical trials to try to compare different types of regimens together, you know, giving this drug at this dose versus this drug at that dose. And then we try to do a lot of trials to figure out what's the best regimen for these uh, patients here, right? Sometimes it's changing the actual drugs, sometimes it's dose, duration, et cetera. Um, but a lot of patients you're gonna find are gonna be on study is what we call that when they're on an actual trial and to try to determine again, what's the best treatment for them. Here is an example of a roadmap. We call these roadmaps. These are useful because they're trying to they kind of lay out what specifically that patient is supposed to be getting and when they're supposed to be getting it. Now, I only show you one of these just to give you an idea of just how in depth and how kind of complicated some of these regimens can actually be. So here is one uh, that we have for a patient uh, with ALL. And again, this is not patient specific. It's just kind of a random one we pulled. Um, this is actually one we use over at Nemours. And so if you ever hear of COG, that stands for Children's Oncology Group. If you ever deal with PEDS cancer, this is you're going to see a lot of things that look like this. But here's an example of, okay, here they're in this consolidation phase of their chemotherapy regimen. You see the different drugs they may be receiving here. We're gonna cover all of these here. Um, you're gonna see the route they're gonna be getting, the dose, what days specifically they're gonna be getting. And notice here, some of them you're only gonna get like a one-time dose, right? Maybe on day one and then on day 29. Sometimes you're gonna be getting them for multiple days. So for instance, here with cytarabine, you get on days one through four, eight through 11. Notice there's kind of multiple repeated rounds of this, okay? You can see here that you have to make sure you're marking off every single dose that's being given because, again, when they're coming in week to week, you want to make sure that previous doses were received. If not, you got to figure out what happened. Um, you, know, you need to figure out if they're making counts, all these different things there. So you can kind of see how it can get pretty, pretty complicated. Um, and, again, these are the highest risk medications when you're dealing with, with patients, right? Um, you know, it's not like Tylenol. Tylenol, you have a pretty wide margin of error when you're given that drug there. But chemotherapy, it's poison, basically. So you have to be really careful with it. So just memorize that roadmap and then you can just repeat that on the test. Just kidding, no. But again, that's why we, we go back and we always wanna make sure we're, we're kind of make sure we know exactly what we're doing for those patients and those roadmaps will be very useful. Okay, so let's look at other types of therapies. We mentioned that uh, a lot of those traditional chemotherapeutic drugs, they tend to be not very specific for healthy cells versus cancer cells. Nowadays, we're getting more specialized. We're getting better drugs that are gonna be able to target very specific targets here. And that way, that if you have cancer cells that only express one particular type of receptor, well, what if I had a drug that specifically targeted that? That's gonna help us to be much more specific. That's gonna help us to limit a lot of that toxicity you're gonna see with that. So certain types of cancer, their treatment has been revolutionized by the, the introduction of some of these biologic types of therapies, uh, some of these immunotherapies, a lot of different options here. but Looking at this, you're going to find that with targeted therapy, this just means we're shooting for small molecules, 
And again, a lot of times these are extracellular receptors. So again, if you have a specific type of cancer that has a mutation where it expresses this type of CD receptor, we can target that very specifically with a particular drug, right? Um, sometimes we're targeting specific growth factors. So if I can maybe bind that up with an antibody and target it for destruction by the immune system, it's not going to be able to stimulate growth in those cells there, right? Um, a lot of these are going to be what we consider biologics. When I say biologic, what does that mean? Generally, they're protein-based products, right? So again, as opposed to just like, a, say, a chemical, you know, chemotherapy, these are biologic products where a lot of these are going to be typically monoclonal antibodies, things like vaccines count in this, different growth factors. So we're going to look at some different options here. Now, this aspect of chemotherapy is kind of exploding, right? And I can spend, you know, an entire semester going over all these different drugs and their specific targets. And guess what? Even I don't know all of them, right? So again, um, again, I don't deal with cancer every single day. I don't particularly like cancer a whole lot. However, I guess who does like cancer, but I don't like to treat cancer very much. Um, however, um, you know, you still are going to deal with it. You know, even if you don't deal in oncology specifically, you're going to have these patients that come in and you have to be at least familiar with some of these drugs, at least know where to look up the information about them. Okay. Um, but again, what do you think about these biologic? What do you think the cost is for some of these? Very expensive, right? However, if you can potentially cure that patient's cancer, that tends to be a lot cheaper in the long run, right? So there's different considerations we'll be seeing here. But um, we'll talk about a couple of uh, a couple of different agents that fall into this category. But again, it's going to be a very cursory, sort of very kind of uh, surface level sort of examination of them. The main ones I'm going to be talking about are kind of the tried and true traditional sort of chemotherapy agents that we use every single day. Now, the other thing I would uh, make note of is like I deal specifically with pediatric cancer. That's really the only thing I've had much exposure to. Um, so again, I can't really speak much towards the adult side of things. Um, and you'll see for some of these drugs we're going to talk about, I may have a couple of indications. These are just sort of for your, for your, you know, kind of uh, give you an idea of where you might see these being used. I'm not going to ask you specifically which drug is, is used for ALL versus CML versus this is not where we're at as far as the chemotherapy goes. I'm going to be asking more specifically about things like mechanism of action, side effects, drug interactions, et cetera, right? Um, rather than getting into the nitty gritty, which one of these is used for rhabdomyosarcoma that's relapsed? Like, even I don't know that stuff, right? I look, I look it up, or I figure out what, what regimen they're on, I can look that stuff up. Anyway, um, obviously patient education is going to be super important here. Obviously, the earlier we can catch this stuff, the more likely we are to be able to treat this. Um, but again, education about side effects of the drug, what they should be expecting, what sort of things they, um, you know, what are emergent symptoms that you should be thinking, oh, I need to get come into the ER for this sort of thing. You know, things like that are really important as far as education goes. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, toxicity goes, we're going to be killing a lot of rapidly dividing cells. We talked about the GI tract being a big target for this. We talked about the alopecia. We talked about the bone marrow suppression. Uh, even reproductive cells are going to be taking a bit, uh, big hit here, right? So you may see things like infertility uh, while they're on chemotherapy uh, for some of these patients here. And again, a lot of these drugs, do you think these are going to be teratogens or not? A fetus is basically what? big bunch of rapidly dividing cells. So yeah, they're going to be targets for these drugs too. So again, most of these, you want to make sure your patients are not pregnant with them before they receive these. And again, a lot of these drugs may not just be used specifically for cancer. You're often going to find, especially for a lot of rheumatologic conditions or autoimmune conditions, you're going to find that some of these are pulling double duty. So for instance, methotrexate is a big one. We're going to see that used for rheumatoid arthritis. You can also see it used for cancer. Use it differently, but it's the same drug essentially. So it's good to be familiar with these drugs because we're going to talk about them in later uh, disease states as well. Okay, as I mentioned, a lot of different resistance patterns uh, that can develop over time over repeated exposure to these drugs. Um, very similar actually to, to what we see with a lot of uh, antibiotics, right, and the resistance that develops to them. Um, just know there's different ways you can change your targets, you can try to change uh, transcription factors, you can change a lot of things to try to make these drugs less effective. And again, you're just kind of monitoring the, and to see how the drug's working. If it stops working, you got to change to something else. Okay, so our goal of therapy, are we always going to be treating it from a curative sort of standpoint? No, sometimes we may be going into more of a palliative sort of mode there, right? Just trying to improve the quality of life, not necessarily the quantity of life. Um, so again, just, you know, you'll learn about, you know, things like trying to figure out when is, which one is appropriate. You know, certain cancers are very treatable, some ones are not so treatable. And sometimes we're just helping to manage a lot of the symptoms of disease, try to make them at least a little bit more comfortable uh, before they, they make their celestial discharge. Uh, all right, so getting into the actual drugs themselves. Again, this is not an all-encompassing list. It's not exhaustive. My lectures tend to be pretty exhaustive, as you guys may know, right? If you're sleeping already, you can tell. Okay. Um, all right, so looking at some different targets here, right? So we're going to get into specific categories and where these drugs are going to be working. Again, focus on the mechanisms, focus on the interactions, the side effects, et cetera, okay? Especially if there's any unique side effects to particular ones, which is going to be evident when you go back to look at Chemo Man, you realize where those specific side effects are going to be coming into play there. But we're going to see some options here. So, for instance, we can do things like affecting 
actual production of the, the nucleotides actually get involved in DNA. We're going to be looking at things that actually affect the DNA specifically. We're going to be looking at things that affect topoisomerase and all of that, right? A lot of these are actually going to be very similar to other drugs we talked about in terms of antivirals or antibiotics, and so you're going to find a lot of carryover here as well. They're different drugs, different classes. However, a lot of the mechanisms are going to kind of be um, uh, pretty similar uh, to a lot of the antibiotics we've already talked about. Okay, so first off, let's talk about the anti-metabolites. Anyone know what anti-metabolite means? Um, so they, they work on metabolism. A lot of it has to do with actually the production of DNA. A lot of it, um, some, so to some degree, RNA, but a lot of this is going to be um, affecting the nucleotides that make up DNA and RNA, right? So we're either going to be trying to substitute in false nucleotides or we're going to try to be interacting with the nucleotides our body's already producing in order to make it so that we cannot produce any more DNA. So what's the goal of that? Why, why, what's the big deal with messing up the DNA? If you can't produce new DNA, guess what? You can't replicate that cell, right? There's no blueprints for it to work off of, right? Um, what else do you think that could, what uh, sort of impact do you think that has on the DNA itself and our, say, our healthy cells? You screw up the DNA, what can happen? Mutations. mutations, right? What happens when you get a mutation, potentially? Superpowers? No, that would be awesome. That's not the case, though. We get mutations, you can see sometimes new cancers that can develop here. This is why a lot of these anti-cancer drugs can actually cause secondary uh, cancers themselves because they're causing mutations in those healthy cells. Okay, so one thing to consider there. Okay, and again, it's a double edged sword. You have to make sure that you're weighing those risks versus the benefits there. But, and again, a lot of times our body can't tell the difference between, you know, uh, the healthy or the drugs can't tell the difference between healthy cells versus cancer cells. You're going to find that these are going to be pretty non specific and kind of affect both. But the big thing is they're going to be affecting more often the, the cells that are actively replicating, they're producing new DNA. These are going to be much more uh, susceptible to this, uh, as you're going to see. So anyway, so a couple of op options we have here, including pyrimidine analogs or purine analogs, right? So again, kind of getting into specific nucleotide types, and then also folate antagonists, okay? Anyone know any folate antagonists on the antibiotic side of things? Bactrim, yeah, sulfur methoxazole trimethoprim, right? works uh, sort of in a similar fashion to that in here in just a few minutes. But looking at our pyrimidine analogs, so these are going to include things like um, cytarabine. And one of the things you'll see is that certain um, groups of drugs, you're going to find that a lot of acronyms get used. Are acronyms a good thing in medicine, typically? What's the problem with acronyms? A good shorthand, right? It's good for communicating with, between healthcare providers. What's the problem with them? If you get them mixed up or if you use the wrong acronym, people might not be familiar with the acronyms, right? So again, if I go walking into, say, an HIV clinic, all their different drugs have very odd sort of um, uh, acronyms that they use. Some of it's based off the chemical name, some of it's based off the brand name. Um, it can be very easy if you're not familiar with these drugs, you get very confused and maybe make a medical error. Um, so again, I will put up things like the, the typical abbreviations you may see for these. Um, again, for my test, I'm gonna have the generic name and the brand name, right? So again, uh, I'll just kind of put these up here just for your reference. So if you ever hear about someone who's on Era C, you're gonna know that's cytarabine basically, right? Or you'll get a familiarity with that. But here we're gonna find cytarabine's a cytidine analog. And so basically what happens here is it's going to get phosphorylated and actually gets incorporated into the DNA, right? So DNA polymerase will kind of incorporate into the DNA. And then from there, it can't really elongate that any further, okay? So for instance, when you're looking at this, you see just by changing where the hydroxyl group is, you make it so that you cannot uh, add on any nucleotides after that. By doing that, it works as sort of what we call a chain terminator. Basically, you cannot elongate that DNA any further. And once a cell kind of figures out, hey, there's too much DNA damage here, what does it do? apoptosis right so again the goal here is to try to trigger apoptosis say okay well, let's get rid of this cell it's no good anymore okay so again working as a chain terminator there again you don't have to know the route specifically i just want to kind of make some points here you know we can give drugs intravenously or we could uh, potentially giving intrathecally what's the benefit of intrathecal drug administration you bypass what particular barrier the blood-brain barrier, right? So if you have cancer cells that are residing with the CNS, you're able to get around that by giving intrathecal medication. So this is an example of one we may give intrathecally. This is really important because we're going to find that there's a, a set of drugs you cannot give intrathecally, otherwise it is fatal. It's a huge medication risk. Uh, we're going to see with that. And again, a lot of times you're going to find as patients are getting multiple drugs at the same time, you got to make sure you're not getting screwed up. I'll give you that example later on. But, um, you know, we use ARC almost every single day treating uh, pediatric cancers. We see a lot of leukemias in that, uh, in that, that, um, that age bracket. But looking at this, you're going to see the toxicities are going to be pretty similar amongst the majority of these kind of traditional sort of chemotherapeutics. So what do you see here? We see dose-limiting leukopenia, right? So again, you're monitoring things like the neutrophil count. You're going to see thrombocytopenia. You're going to be monitoring for their platelet count and make sure that they have reconstituted themselves before they get that next dose, okay? Um, 
nausea, vomiting, mucositis, right? Again, the GI tract is going to be playing a big role here. You're going to be seeing a lot of those cells taking a hit. Mucositis can be very problematic, right? Because um, what else could happen if you have a lot of mucositis, a lot of inflammation there in the mouth, you're inhibiting their immune system, what can happen? Infection, right? So again, oral hygiene is really, really important for these patients. You want to make sure they have good oral hygiene, make sure they don't get any secondary infections there. Um, now, uh, one of the unique things you may see with uh, ARC is this is what we call cerebellar syndrome. This is particularly seen with large doses or maybe patients who can't clear it very well. So particularly like renal uh, dysfunction here, see things like ataxia and nystagmus. Um, so again, if you notice any kind of changes in mental status or any sort of neurologic findings, like it's a good role just to say, hey, let's hold on a second, figure out what's going on. Let's look at the drug regimen to see if any of these are playing a role here. Okay. Um, other things you can see, you see kind of a conjunctivitis. Um, oftentimes, we will have patients be on steroid eye drops, and that will help to kind of limit that, right? So working as an anti-inflammatory can kind of help um, and, and prevent a lot of the conjunctivitis from getting any worse, right? If you don't want to use the steroids, which, again, we've covered off those drugs already, so we know some of the side effects of those, um, saline eye drops is a good alternative as well. Okay. Uh, another one that we have here is going to be uh, gemcitabine. This is structurally related to, to cytarabine. What do you kind of notice about the structure here? You see a lot of fluoride in your, or fluorine in your uh, nucleotides? Not usually, right? So again, by in, uh, kind of introducing new elements here, DNA polymerase doesn't know what to do with that. So again, working as a chain terminator, right? So against a different drug, you know, maybe if you found someone had resistance to ARC, you could switch over to something like gemcitabine. That may work a little bit better for them, depending on, on the case, right? Um, so again, very similar toxicity, because again, it's doing the same thing essentially, right? So you're gonna see those rapidly dividing cells taking a big hit here, okay? Um, again, with this one, you can see some flu-like symptoms, so you have myalgias, low-grade fever, things like that. Um, again, treat it supportively, right? Things like over-the-counter Tylenol are gonna be fine for those type of patients, right? Okay, um, next we have a pyrimidine analog. This one's called 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. So you can always tell your patients, hey, 5-FU. <laughs> So this one's kind of interesting because it's not working specifically. It's not itself getting incorporated into the DNA, but it's actually inhibiting new production of, of nucleotides. So uh, specifically what you're going to find here, this works as a false pyrimidine, is so inhibiting this thymidylate synthase. So basically you can't actually produce new thymidine, right? So again, instead of working on the purine side of things, this is now we're working on the pyrimidine side. And so by doing this, you're going to be able to inhibit that incorporation to RNA, inhibit the function of RNA. And then again, we're trying to get to that point where we're causing enough damage to where we're causing apoptosis to occur here. Okay, so this is where you can see 5-FU kind of uh, playing a role here. It's basically going to be acting as a target for this thymidylate synthase, and then you cannot produce new thymidine, okay? Notice here, we're going to find methotrexate is also going to be playing a role here. So we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes here. But again, this is going to be that Foley antagonist we're, we talked about a few minutes ago. But um, again, very similar side effects we you see with this. Um, now, does anyone know what I mean when I say hand-foot syndrome? This is a peripheral neuropathy that can happen with certain chemotherapeutic drugs, and they typically will uh, be seen kind of at the, the distal ends of the limbs. So again, if they ever have like a stocking glove uh, sort of pattern is another term you might hear about that. Um, again, the tips of the toes, fingertips are going to be getting um, uh, sort of a you know uh, neuropathy associated with that. That's again, one of those things where you want to say, hey, we probably don't want to give any more drug uh, because again, a lot of that stuff cannot be reversible, right? Maybe partially reversible, but in a lot of cases, you don't want to keep adding insult to injury uh, for those patients. And again, very other otherwise similar side effects to the purine analogs we've already seen. Yes, ma'am. No, um, we don't see that giving. And again, which um, which uh, do you, what do you give for isoniazid? Be six, right? Pyridoxine, right? So we're going to be giving pyridoxine for that uh, patient. You don't necessarily see the same benefit here, right? Uh, unfortunately. And we're going to see with like things like methotrexate, you can give folic acid or the active form in order to um, prevent some of those adverse effects, but nothing like that here necessarily, right? So it's one of those things where once you see it, you kind of just don't want to give any, any further drug. You need to switch them over to a different regimen. And a lot of times with these more common things that you see, or maybe they're rare, but they're significant, um, they will have, um, you know, addenda to those roadmaps where you say, okay, well, they developed this toxicity, switch over to this this uh, regimen, right? So then you'll switch out to a different drug potentially, or maybe alter the dose, or there's lots of different things you can see with that. And again, you're not expected to be oncology experts by the time you leave this class. I just want you to have at least a passing familiarity with a lot of these drugs, because you will see patients who are on these um, from time to time. Another purine analog is going to be 6-mercaptopurine, or 6-MP, if you ever see that, that's what we're referring to. Um, again, this is commonly used to treat a lot of different um, uh, leukemias, uh, particularly ALL is one of the big ones we treat a lot with the pediatric cancers. Again, don't know the specific indications. I'm just trying to give you some idea of where you might see these potentially. Um, thioguanine is another one that kind of fits in that same category. You can see here they're pretty similar in structure um, to one another. And again, once they get incorporated into that DNA, 
the active of chain terminator cannot produce any other, uh, cannot elongate that DNA any further once these get incorporated into the mix here, okay? Um, again, hepatotoxicity is going to be a big thing you watch out for this one. So you're monitoring things like LFTs, you're monitoring the INR, things like that potentially. Um, and then you may also see for some patients, pharmacogenetics are playing a role here. And so when I say pharmacogenetics, what does that mean? Differences in the patient's genetics having a role how they handle these drugs, either from a pharmacodynamic standpoint, how well they're responding to the drug, or how they're actually metabolizing, clearing the drug, et cetera. So you may find some patients uh, may have difference in enzyme expression, may lead them to worsen toxicity, right? So if you see someone who's just developing really bad toxicity from this, really bad myelosuppression, perhaps they cannot clear the drug as well. Again, you may need to alter the dose. These are things you're going to be looking for. And the last uh, ones out of this uh, group here is going to be the folate antagonist, and methotrexate is a big one here. Methotrexate you're going to see quite a bit, so I'm going to focus on this one a little bit more, um, just from a side effect profile and antidotes and things like that, because it is used very frequently for cancer. You see it a lot used for rheumatologic conditions as well, so you see this rheumatoid arthritis quite frequently. Um, but methotrexate, MTX is another uh, abbreviation you may see for this. Rheumatrex would be uh, the kind you're using for, for rheumatoid arthritis. Now this one is going to be used um, uh, in higher doses to treat cancer and lower doses, especially more chronic dosing, you're going to see that used more for autoimmune conditions, okay? Um, again, because again, what is the problem with, uh, with autoimmune conditions? Your immune system is fighting you, right? Sensing you as the foreign invader. Um, and so by inhibiting that immune system, you hopefully you can limit some of that inflammation. So again, with cancer, with leukemia, I'm trying to knock down that immune system because those are the cancer cells I'm trying to affect here, right? Versus with autoimmune conditions, I just want to knock it down a little bit. So the doses are typically a lot lower. Toxicity should be lower too. Um, but again, the way it's working is basically by inhibiting this dihydrofolate reductase. So by doing that, you cannot utilize uh, folic acid appropriately. You cannot activate the folic acid, and thus you're not going to be able to um, produce things like thymidine. Okay, um, so again, kind of similar to what we saw with uh, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, it's inhibiting the ability for these cells to utilize the folic acid. Okay, but again, the targets are different between methotrexate and sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim because again, one's targeting bacteria, one's targeting our cells. Um, this is another one you may see being used orally pretty frequently, especially for those autoimmune conditions. We use the IV, and this is another intrathecal one we give uh, pretty commonly as well. What do you think is uh, um, a particular concern whenever you're giving a drug intrathecally? Infection is a big thing, right? So again, you have to use what we call aseptic technique. You should always use aseptic technique, which means you're uh, trying not to introduce any bugs or critters into the patient. Um, but it's particularly important there because, again, once you cross that blood-brain barrier, you really want to be careful about introducing any new microbes or viruses or anything like that because the patient, it's harder to fight off infections from that case there. So um, you can be very careful whenever you're doing the intrathecal drugs. Um, usually this is done under uh, anesthesia. You start off with a lumbar puncture, and then you can administer these drugs uh, directly intrathecally. But there. Um, so toxicity here, these are big things to note. So with toxicity, again, myosuppression, GI toxicity, okay, we've seen this before, um, pretty common. Hepatotoxicity is a big one. I remember my aunt was diagnosed with, uh, with a, a very treatable form of breast cancer a long time ago, and the first thing she said when she got her methotrexate was, well, great, now I can't drink. So again, be careful with drinking because it's going to exacerbate the, the hepatic effects here and can worsen the uh, hepatotoxicity. So you want to be careful with that. Um, renal toxicity is another big one as well. Methotrexate, if it is in a particular condition where maybe the urine is very acidic or if it's very concentrated, you're going to find that it has the ability to crystallize out. So it's kind of similar to what we saw with a cyclovir where you can see this crystal urea that can happen here. This is where these uh, crystals can actually uh, precipitate in the renal tubules, and that can cause an interstitial sort of damage to the kidneys. So you got to be really careful with this. One of the things we can do, though, is to try, and how do you think we can combat that? What's that happens really acidic urine, very concentrated urine? What could I do to try to prevent that? can either alkalize the urine, and what else could we do? Dilute it, right? So again, give them a lot of fluids, right? Make sure they are very well hydrated. There's particular ones we're going to see here where hydration is really important. This can be one of them. The other thing we can do is we can try to alkalize the urine. And what do we use to alkalize the urine? Sodium bicarb, right? So that's going to be our typical go-to sort of agent there. Um, sodium bicarb has lots of uses uh, in medicine, but this is a case here where we're using it to alkalize the urine. By increasing the pH, you make the drug more soluble. You're going to make it less likely to crystallize out there in those renal tubules. So that's a big thing to consider there as well. Um, methotrexate also is pretty highly protein bound to albumin. So if you had something else come along and kick methotrexate off, that could then increase that free fraction, increase toxicity. Same is also true of the, uh, the flip side of that, where if methotrexate kicks something else off of albumin, you can see increased effects from that drug as well. Okay. 
Now, antidotes. When I talk about antidotes, these are important because it's good to know if you have a drug that's maybe becoming too toxic, how can I reverse those effects? Okay. And again, I like toxicology, so I like antidotes quite a bit. So that's why I harp on this so much. Um, first off, so if I were to give a patient who's on methotrexate folic acid, would that be effective? You would say no, because you just said, based on the mechanism of the drug, you can't activate the folic acid. So I can give them folic acid all day long. You're really going to find it doesn't really do you a whole lot of good. What I can do is give the activated form. I can bypass the methotrexate and actually try to, uh, again, start to now produce those new nucleotides to make that new DNA by bypassing the drug. This is where we have what we call folinic acid. Okay, This is not folic acid, it's folinic acid, and this is the activated form. And this is what we call leucovorin rescue. So frequently uh, what we'll do, especially with patients getting very large doses of methotrexate, we'll give them a big dose up front. We know we're going to be targeting tons of cancer cells, but also the healthy cells as well. And then after a period of time, then we'll give them the leucovorin, right? So the goal there is to not try to save the cancer cells, but try to replenish the healthy cells, right? Try to give them some activated folinic acid so that way they can then start to produce some new DNA. So that is done pretty frequently. Um, a lot of it is sometimes done based on levels of methotrexate. This is another one we'll actually monitor levels for to make sure they're clearing it well. Um, as I mentioned, sodium bicarb is good to, uh, to alkalinize the urine and try to make sure they can uh, you know, eliminate that through the kidneys well. And then this is actually a, a newer one called glucarpidase or viraxase. This is actually a very expensive one. I think the last time I looked at the cost for this one was about $100,000 just for one dose. Uh, so we don't use it very frequently, but I mention it here because this one's interesting because if you had a patient who could not clear the methotrexate, let's say they had a kidney injury that's preventing them from clearing it well, this drug actually is enzymatically going in and will cleave the methotrexate to an inactive form. Okay, So this one actually will go in and deactivate it completely versus something like sodium bicarb, which just helps us with the what? The elimination, right? Helps us to clear it a little bit faster. The hydration helps us to clear it faster. This one drug, this glucarpidase, actually comes in and, and we'll just inactivate it completely. Okay, so it's kind of an interesting one. You may see it if you ever have like an accidental overdose or a patient who just can't clear the drug themselves. And they have particularly high levels, we'll use this occasionally. Uh, I think we use it once or twice ever for our patients, um, but it just depends on you know your population. All right, any questions so far? Okay, um, up next, we're kind of transitioning over from affecting the nucleotide, either replacing the nucleotides or preventing production of the nucleotides. Now we're moving into the microtubule targeting drugs. Now, why do you think this plays a big role in cell reproduction? What do the microtubules do? They're very important for mitosis. What do they do in mitosis? They pull the chromosomes apart, right? So if I inhibit that, either with the production or the breakdown of the microtubules, you're going to find that um, you are unable to have a successful mitosis, right? So you're going to be able to arrest that. So these are specifically going to be ones that help with the M phase, right? So you're going to find these are going to be very specific for the M phase of cell reproduction there, right? And again, microtubules is also really important for the cytoskeleton, as you're going to see. It kind of gives the cell some sort of structure there. Um, but the, the chromosome separation is a big thing, okay? Um, now we're going to find two main classes of drugs that affect this uh, most frequently. These are going to be the taxanes, and then we're going to have the vinca alkaloids. Okay, and so we're going to go over uh, these specific classes here. So first off, we have the taxanes. Anyone know what plant this is? It's actually a yew tree, not a me tree, but a yew tree. Y-E-W. Um, I think it's a, uh, specifically a Pacific U. Um, but this is, uh, I just like to illustrate where we get like natural sources for drugs. And so this is one of the cases there. So if you have a patient who's like, I just want organic drugs, man, this could be one of them potentially, right? Because it actually comes from a plant. Um, they don't go around here, but I remember one time I went to, uh, again, this is not a humble brag, but I went to Ireland on a trip uh, and I saw they had a lot of yew trees are growing around. And so I said, don't eat those to my wife. And she said, why would I eat those? And I said, well, because they're poisonous. And you might be tempted like a child, but she was not, fortunately. Anyway, um, so two main drugs that fit into this category, we have paclitaxel and we have docetaxel. Okay, so you see taxel, you don't want to think taxanes, okay? Um, and so the mechanism here is that they will help to promote the microtubule formation, but they prevent the breakdown, okay? So again, you can form the microtubules to, to try to separate the chromosomes, but you won't be able to break them down if you can't do that process of it, then you can't finish uh, the mitosis there, okay? Um, basically, it'll kind of form these stable but non-functional microtubules that aren't working very well. You're not going to find that you cannot complete mitosis, okay? Now, the big thing you're going to find with this one is myelosuppression is going to happen with both of them. That makes sense. We know why that is based off of a lot of the other ways that chemotherapy drugs are affecting this, uh, uh, the cells. Um, but some of the unique things, for one, dose attacks, we see fluid retention, okay? Again, who knows why that mechanism is, but you see fluid retention. Who might that be a problem for? 
yes. CHF patients, right? Or maybe has someone like uh, significant liver disease and they have ascites, right? These are things we want to be careful and, and, and avoid that for those patients. What can I do to treat that fluid retention? Diuretics such as? Loops such as? Furosemide. Furosemide is a really good one, right? So again, it's good to know, oh, I would treat that with a diuretic. Okay, which one? Uh, a loop. Okay, well, which one? Right. So again, you got to dig a couple steps down there, right? You want to be able to at least come up with a drug. Eventually, be able to come up with a dose and how often you want to give it, et cetera. But we're trying to get those, those associations being made. There. So again, diuretics would be good to help with that fluid retention if that was occurring there. However, what do you have to worry about if you have a lot of fluid retention happening? Given diuretics, what do you have to think about? Electrolytes, right? Magnesium, potassium, calcium, all these different things you have to think about, right? Um, Paclitaxel also causes a, uh, a peripheral neuropathy uh, that can happen here. Again, this is a very similar to causing that stocking glove sort of uh, distribution. Again, the fingers and the toes are typically the first things you're going to see getting affected by that. Um, this is also where we're going to see some hypersensitivity. So again, you can't have allergic reactions to this one in particular, so you got to be careful with that. Um, we'll talk a lot more about allergic reactions to these drugs, uh, specifically when we get to the uh, like the immunotherapies and the protein-based products, but this is a particular one I'll kind of note here as well. Um, now again, we talk a lot about pretreatment for a lot of these patients as well, right? So you may pretreat them with antiemetics. May pre treat them with different types of drugs. Here we'd actually use a corticosteroid. And so, what do you think that would do for us here? Well, if I'm worried about having an allergic reaction to the drug, what do I treat allergic reactions with? Steroids, right? Like, like what? Prednisone. Dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, hydrocortisone. Right? You have a lot of different options here in the corticosteroid category, but oftentimes we'll pre treat these patients. We'll give them a steroid beforehand to try to prevent the allergic reaction from happening, right? And again, we give a 30 minutes, an hour beforehand. That way, we try to prevent any sort of uh, effects from happening from that standpoint. Okay, so think about why we're giving these drugs. One of the other things you'll actually find is that, um, you know, with, uh, I think I'll mention it later, but also we can use um, things like steroids as an actual part of the treatment. Because again, what, is, uh, what does a corticosteroid do to the immune system. It suppresses it, right? And again, who that might that be useful for with cancer? Leukemias, right? Because again, their immune system is what the problem is, right? They're dividing all these white blood cells. So maybe if I can tamp that down, that can be useful there. Um, also, you're going to find some of these corticosteroids actually have some good anti-emetic activity as well. So sometimes we can give that to help with a release from the nausea and vomiting. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you said that the um, hypersensitivity is specifically for the See, a little bit more commonly with paclitaxel, but it certainly could happen with either one, potentially. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, corticosteroids can make you retain fluid with the one mm -hmm. that has fluid. Very good point. Right. So this is where we're starting to see, you know, uh, by giving a treatment for a drug, by giving another drug, you may need more drugs afterwards, right? So you can see how it kind of is a little bit of a sick cycle there. But absolutely, you could see fluid retention as a result of the corticosteroids due to what sort of effects? We call that the fluid mineral sort of alterating effects. Mm -hmm. Mineralocorticoid effects, right? So again, if I give somebody dexamethasone that has some mineralocorticoid effects, I hold on to more fluid, right? It's kind of working like aldosterone in that sense, right? Good. All this stuff comes back. I mean, connections upon connections, right? Hopefully. Nobody? Okay. You can review this later, though. You'll find out. Um, next up, we have the Vinca alkaloids. Anyone know what type of plant this is? It's a periwinkle. Very good. Yeah, so this is another type of plant which has uh, a natural source. And again, I don't know who the first person was that figured out that a periwinkle plant happens to have these vinca alkaloids. Hopefully no one was eating it and found that out. But um, a couple agents we have in this category, uh, vincristine, we have vinblastine, and venerelbine. Okay, you can see how these are um, abbreviated here. Now, some of you might not know what a VCR is, but oftentimes that gets confused, right? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, anyway. Um, so if you see VCR in a, in a medical chart, the patient probably has cancer because they're getting vincristine or, I don't know, they had the video cassette recorder. Who knows? Anyway, um, VBL for vinblastine. So you'll see some of these abbreviations come up pretty commonly here. Now, we use vincristine almost every single day um, for a lot of our pediatric leukemias and things like that. So it's a very commonly used drug. I probably um, verify orders for this every day that I'm there uh, for sure. These are going to be working with the microtubules, but instead of preventing the breakdown of them, you're going to find this actually disrupts the actual formation of the microtubules. Okay, so again, this is working on the production, the taxanes we're working on the breakdown thereof, right? Um, again, so the cells cannot complete mitosis, so the cells cannot divide. You're arresting that those cancer cells from from further duplicating themselves. Now, this is the ones I talked about being fatal if given intrathecally. So, I'll say that again. Fatal if given intrathecally. So, why do you think we make such a big deal about this? because someone's probably given intrathecally and caused someone to die from this, right? So again, these are big ones I always want to make notes of as these things that are potentially really fatal. Um, again, 
who knows what the full mechanism is, but we just know that this is the case. So this is a problem. So imagine, and again, this is a very common scenario. We'll have a patient who's getting intrathecal methotrexate and they're getting IV vincristine. So what are some ways you think we could do to not to make sure those don't get screwed up? Let me give one either way. Hmm? So you want to have a lot of notations, right? So like on your labels and things like that, you want to say fatal if given intrathecally, big letters, right? That's one thing we can do to try to alert people. Now, do those sort of signs always work? No? I mean, we have still have a sign in the men's room uh, that says, make sure you flush the toilet after you're done. I don't know if the ladies have that, but I don't know if everyone actually reads that or not. <laughs> signs don't always work, unfortunately, right? Um, other things we do. So for instance, when you're giving a drug intrathecally, you're giving it via syringe, right? So you drop the drug into a syringe. We make sure that we never put vincristine into a syringe. That way, it's never able to accidentally be hooked up into uh, that catheter that's in the patient's back and then to accidentally give it. So we'll only give it in, say, like an IV bag. So that way that it's incompatible. You can never mix them up, right? So little things like that we do to try to make sure that it is error-proof, right? Now, is it anything really ever going to be error-proof? Absolutely not. We try to make it error-resistant as much as we can, right? Just remember the Swiss cheese model I talked about? Again, you want to make sure you're not one of those holes that are lining up to cause that error to occur there, okay? Anyway, so big thing to note with that. Um, other things. You're going to see a lot of myosuppression suppression with these drugs as well, vincristine, uh, vinblastine especially. Um, and then as well, vincristine, you do see that hand-foot sort of peripheral neuropathy as well. We actually had one patient who um, we could not give any more vincristine to because the patient's neuropathies were so bad. And actually, the doc would have to go back in every single visit to see how it was progressing and say, okay, well, it's gotten a little better. Maybe we'll give another dose. Maybe not. And so it's very kind of hit or miss as to whether, whether we could actually give the drug. Um, another thing to note here as well is that you can also see this paralytic ileus. A lot of it stems back from the neurotoxicity you can see with that. So constipation is another big thing you may see with vincristine. Okay, so one thing to note with that. Um, and then I, I mentioned here vesicants. Anyone know what that means? So vesicants basically means it causes vesicles, right? So this is very damaging to the tissue if this goes outside of the vein. Anyone know what you call it when you go outside of the vein? Extra vasation or extra vasation. So this is one of those sets of drugs that when you accidentally infuse it outside of the vein, which can happen if you blow the vein or something like that. So you've got to make sure that when nursing is administering this, and make sure you have a very good IV. If it's central, it's even better. So a lot of these patients who are coming in for frequent uh, administrations will have a port place, so they have kind of like a permanent central line for a period of time. This helps to make sure they're going to be giving it into the into IVC, where it's nice and diluted versus giving it a peripheral IV. But make sure that the patient is not going to extravasate this, because once it gets into the tissue, it's going to start to cause all kinds of uh, damage there, right? So it's going to be affecting all those nice healthy cells. You're going to see a lot of skin damage happening there. It can be uh, potentially uh, disfiguring. Uh, I've seen amputations occur due to this potentially, so you got to be really careful with these. Um, now, everywhere you work is going to have an extravasation guidelines, so and I'm not going to get super deep into that, but just know there are different uh, therapies you can do with that. Sometimes you want to apply heat to the area to try to help it dissipate and absorb systemically faster. Sometimes you want to put cold on it. Sometimes there's other drugs you're going to give. Just know that it's a vesicant and cause significant damage if given outside of that vein. Okay. All right. And again, just another picture kind of giving you an idea of the different spots of why these drugs are working a little bit differently with um, affecting the microtubules. You can see here where vinblastine will be working specifically versus something like paclitaxel. Just know there's different targets. Again, know that the taxanes are going to be working on preventing the breakdown of microtubules. The uh, vinca alkaloids are going to be working on the actual formation of the microtubules. Okay. And you notice here you'll see a drickle. Colchicine, anyone know where you use colchicine? <laughs> For, uh, we use it for gout most commonly. Right? So if you ever see gout, gout treatment, uh, colchicine is a big one there. That actually affects microtubules as well. So that drug, we'll, we'll talk about that um, later on. I think probably in Farm 2 at some point. Okay. Next up, we have the topoisomerase inhibitors. Anyone know what other drugs we talked about that inhibits topoisomerase? Fluoroquinolones, right? So the, again, this is showing you the parallel between our antibiotics and also our uh, cancer drugs, right? The targets are different. Because one's affecting bacterial topoisomerase, this one's affecting human topoisomerase, okay? So again, um, don't get so, uh, uh, you know, bent out of shape of remembering whether it's topoisomerase 1 or 2. I'll mention them here, but just know whether or not it's a topoisomerase inhibitor, okay? Um, and basically, what does topoisomerase do for us? It helps to relax that superhelical structure, right? It's going to allow it to relax, and that way we can open it up a little bit to allow for things like DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase to come along and do its thing. So if you prevent that... One, you can't unwind. You may not be able to replicate that DNA or produce new RNA. Also, you can increase the number of strain breaks that occur. And when you have more strain breaks, that's more DNA damage that can potentially induce what? Apoptosis, right? So again, causing more damage to that DNA is one of the big uh, big targets here. We're going to find three groups of drugs that uh, work here. So we're going to cause uh, have the epidophilotoxins. It's hard to say, but I'll give you the individual drugs. So you don't have to repeat that. Uh, the anthracyclines and then the canthothecans classes of drug here. Um, so does anyone know what plant this is? 
Probably not. It's a Mayapple, if you're ever curious. Um, again, don't know that for the test. I'm just kind of pointing out just for trivia's sake. Um, if you ever want to impress your friends, be like, oh, do you know that the Periwinkle actually give ink alkaloids from that, right? Very impressive, I, I guarantee you. Um, but looking at the epidophila toxins, the two big ones we have here is the etoposide and then tenipicide, okay? These are going to be working to inhibit topo isomerase 2. These are going to increase those DNA strand breaks, right? So again, if you can't uh, unwind that DNA, if you are causing strand breaks, it's going to eventually cause apoptosis to trigger here, okay? Uh, big things to note, again, dose limiting myelosuppression. suppression. Again, that dose limiting myelosuppression suppression means that we have to monitor those levels. These would be something that would be count dependent. You have to make sure they have achieved a certain level in their neutrophil count or their platelet count to make sure before you give them more drug, right? You want to make sure they've reconstituted that immune system to some degree. Um, alopecia is another big one you can see with the epidophila toxins, nausea, vomiting. Again, those are the things to note. Next up, we have the anthracyclines. And so uh, a couple of kind of prototypical sort of anthracyclines includes doxorubicin, donorubicin, and then mitoxantrone. Um, if you ever see a, a, a cancer patient and they have a red IV bag hanging, and chances are it's probably donorubicin or doxorubicin. It's a very bright red uh, sort of color. You can kind of see that there. Um, so again, what do you think it might do to your secretions? Color them red, right? So again, anytime you're changing colors of things, it's good to educate the patient on. So this one's actually kind of interesting. This one's working on topo isomerase 2, but this has a kind of a unique mechanism here. We've noticed kind of the, the structure here. Of these uh, It's a very planar sort of structure, so it's kind of long and flat. And basically what it does is it can intercalate into the DNA. That's one of my favorite words to say is intercalate. And so basically when it kind of places itself in between the DNA there, and uh, by causing that damage there, you're increasing the strand breaks. It's also producing what we call free radicals. What are free radicals? Is that the name of my high school band? a prog rock sort of group. So basically free radicals means we're producing reactive oxygen species, right? So oxygen, if you were to take an electron off of it, it becomes very reactive. That means it's going to interact with proteins and cause denaturation. It's going to cause a lot of oxidation. So by doing that, you cause increased damage done to those cancerous cells, okay? That's going to be really important for one of the dose-limiting toxicities we're going to see with the anthracyclines in just a minute here. How would you treat free radicals? How would you, if reactive oxygen species, how would you treat I'm sorry? Uh, perfect. Anti uh, antioxidants, right? So we'll talk about those uh, uh, briefly here. But um, so again, myosuppression, definitely going to see that with the anthracyclines. You're going to see, uh, particularly, and this is kind of the unique thing with the anthracyclines, is going to be the cardiotoxicity, okay? Now, the reason why uh, you see this cardiotoxicity is because the heart is not able to really deal with the free radicals as well as other areas of the body. And so as basically due to a kind of a um, uh, you know, reduction of a certain enzyme, the dismutase enzyme that doesn't have to deal with the free radicals. And so you actually find there's a lifetime max that these patients can receive. So again, this is one of the things we have to monitor over time. So if your patient ever had a recurrence of disease or something like that, you have to make sure that they've not exceeded that lifetime max. Uh, because you can see this cardiotoxicity, uh, you can actually develop CHF, this cardiomyopathy. Uh, it means you have to be checking echoes frequently. You have to make sure that they are not developing this. Otherwise, you cannot give any more drugs. So you very unique sort of side effects in the anthrac anthracyclines. Um, as I mentioned, red discoloration, these are also very strong vesicants. So if you look on Chemo Man, if you look back at that page there, you'll see that there's a little IV bag hanging out of them. Those are most of your vesicants we talked about, the big ones, like the vinca alkaloids, the uh, anthracyclines. These are the big ones we're going to talk about here. Um, and here's an antidote. This is actually one we'll sometimes give after we give a, a anthracyclines. This one's called dexrazoxane or Zenicard. And so this is actually a chelator. Remember, we said chelate, chelators do what? Think about little crab claws and they bind up to stuff, right? So you bind it and you inactivate it and prevent it from causing any further damage. Um, and so we will use uh, dexrazoxane, uh, basically has iron in it, uh, or chelate iron to prevent further free radical uh, oxidation from occurring and actually is cardioprotective. So sometimes we can give a bigger lifetime max dose if you're giving dexrazoxane along with this, okay? Okay, uh, next we have the campothecan. So this includes uh, topotecan and then irinotecan. Irinotecan I've kind of alluded to already. Um, here, these are working to inhibit topoisomerase 1. So instead of 2, these are just affecting 1. Um, again, just know topoisomerase inhibitors is the big thing to note there. Now, these are going to have a pretty strong myel suppression. You're going to see a lot of diarrhea with this, and irinotecan is more. The reason for this is, is it actually inhibits acetylcholinesterase. So thinking back, by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, what does that do? Increased levels of acetylcholine, right? Because acetylcholine esterase breaks down acetylcholine. So if I have more acetylcholine, what does that do? Increases parasympathetic activation. What was the mnemonic we used for the parasympathetic side effects? 
dumbbells, right? And again, remember secretions out everywhere. So what was the first, was the D in dumbbells? Diarrhea, right? So uh, defecation, diarrhea, whatever. Um, so either one would be fine there. Uh, this is a big one thing you're going to see with this. So as I mentioned, patient getting irenatique, and we had to give them an anti-peristaltic uh, sort of drug. We'll talk about it later in GI, but it's called uh, loperamide to try to slow down the GI tract to try to uh, counteract some of these effects here. Now, you could give it like another anti cholinergic type of drug like atropine, but then you have to worry about more kind of systemic side effects. So sometimes we try to target things to be a little bit more specific to the effects that they're actually having there, right? So again, a lot of nausea, vomiting, and that makes sense based on the acetylcholinesterase inhibition, uh, alopecia, all that. So again, those are kind of the unique things you're going to see with the campothecans. Okay, uh, up next we have our alkylating agents. Anyone know why I put this here? Mustard gas. These are the first alkylating agents we actually ever had. These are developed um, back in the day. Uh, there's a, a group of, of chemists. If you ever look at your syllabus, which I know none of you would ever do, but if you look at the book list, there's a book called Goodman and Gilman's. These are very old school pharmacologists from way back in the day, and they're just some of the first people to discover the mustard gas, which is used as a chemical uh, weapon in World War One. So this is where they kind of got the beginning of a, of a lot of these. Um, these are the oldest drugs as far as uh, anti-cancer drugs go that we have. They're also very useful at killing off cancer cells. They're excellent killing cancer cells. Guess what else they're excellent killing? Healthy cells as well. So these are very nasty from a toxicity standpoint, right? So again, all the drugs we talked about have their toxicities. These are pretty uh, pretty bad as well. Um, again, that makes sense. It's a chemical warfare agent, right? You can just uh, spray this around and cause all sorts of uh, damage to, to cells and whatnot. And so basically what these are gonna do, these are actually gonna bind covalently to some of the alkyl groups in both proteins and also in DNA. So instead of, uh, for instance, with our anti-metabolites that are trying to substitute for those nucleotides to try to prevent DNA replication, these are going to bind directly to the DNA and disrupt it, causing those mutations, causing uh, the apoptosis to trigger. So do you think these are going to be cell cycle specific? Now, it doesn't matter if this uh, DNA is rapidly dividing or not. It's going to go and just you know, go ahead and bind covalently to them regardless, okay? Uh, so that's why they tend to be so uh, so uh, effective and why they're not going to be cell cycle specific. Also, other things you may find is these cross-links that can happen between the strands. Sometimes you'll find that um, by causing different strands uh, to kind of cross-link together, kind of clump up a little bit, and again, that further increases that damage being done, more likely to see that apoptosis. So um, these are all going to be cytotoxic. They're going to kill off these cells. They're going to be mutagenic, which means what? They're not giving you superpowers. They're giving you more cancer, probably. So you're mutagenic. Uh, they're teratogenic, meaning bad for babies or in developing fetuses. Carcinogenic kind of goes along with the mutagenic, um, giving you more cancer, and they're myelosuppressive. Another big thing you can see as well, especially with more long-term dosing, is going to be this pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, um, There's one particular one we'll talk about as being more common with that, but that's a big thing to think about with the alkylating agents. It's going to be this pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, the first groups we had here were called the nitrogen mustards. And again, I would not put these on your hot dogs <laughs> at all um, because you're going to have some very significant side effects from these. Um, the big ones we have here are going to include cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. These, again, are very common agents used pretty frequently, at least uh, I, do, I do, over for treating uh, pediatric cancers, uh, leukemias and whatnot. Um, we use this all the time, right, almost as much as vincristine and, and methotrexate. But um, the toxicity you're going to see, one of the unique things you see with cyclophosphide and iphosphamide is uh, the formation of a toxic metabolite called acrolein. Acrolein itself does not cause nephrotoxicity, but it causes a hemorrhagic cystitis. Basically, it's going to bind to the bladder and causes hemorrhagic cystitis to occur here, right? So it's a unique thing you see with cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. So the way we deal with that is by giving an antidote called mesna. You ever see mesna? That's what we're giving it for, right? So basically, it's going to help to uh, bind and inactivate the acrolein. And that will help to prevent that hemorrhagic cystitis from occurring. Okay, so again, antidote for cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide is going to be mesna. Uh, if I said a antidote to doxorubicin, you would say dextrazoxane, right? You're going to go back and look at that. If I said antidote to methotrexate, you would say sodium bicarb, folinic acid, and then glucarfidase, right? You have a couple of different options there, right? It's good to know how they were kind of working a little differently. Um, also, these need to be uh, given with vigorous hydration. So you'll, sometimes you'll see these patients getting two, three, four times their normal maintenance fluid rates in order to make sure they're very well hydrated. Because again, a lot of these patients, they don't have a problem with their kidneys. So if I give you a ton of fluids, you're just going to pee it right out. And that's good because we want to make sure we're flushing out the bladder constantly to make sure that we are going to make sure that acrolein does not build up and cause any further damage. Okay. 
Um, other things you're going to see, you can definitely see, uh, you know, alopecia, some renal toxicity, not as common as some of these other agents, but you uh, can see it. And then also kind of uniquely here, you see the CNS toxicity. This is more seen with ifosamide, but you can uh, develop sort of encephalopathy sort of looking picture there. So if you see altered mental status from the patient getting ifosamide, that's probably what you're looking at there. Uh, next, we have the nitrose ureas. Uh, two big ones here are going to include carmistine or lomistine. Kind of notice these, uh, the, the way they're abbreviated, abbreviated BCNU versus CCNU. Again, it just depends on where you're working, what kind of abbreviations they're going to use here. This one's kind of interesting because these will be used for brain cancers, and that's just actually what you're looking at there. They actually have these wafers uh, that are uh, impregnated with the drug itself, and then that way you can actually place it after you were to, say, resect a brain tumor uh, and leave it there. And why would you want to do that? Am I going to get every single cancer cell when I take that out? No. So you put those in there to kind of stay and kind of uh, leave some residual drug there to try to get any other cells that may um, still be oncogenic, right? Uh, so that's kind of one unique sort of dosage form may see with that. Again, not the wafers I'd probably recommend eating ever, right? That's why drug looks like candy to children, okay? We have mustard, we got wafer, you know, all those kinds of stuff. Um, also, some of these drugs can sometimes be used to prep a patient for bone marrow transplant. So again, if we can kind of wipe out all their own natural bone marrow by giving some of these uh, um, uh Drugs that can help to kind of prep them and allow for the new bone marrow when it gets implanted to um, actually kind of take hold there, which can be good. Again, very significant myelosuppression can be fatal if given right. So, again, this can be uh, very significant. Now, does anyone know um, what I mean when I say nadir or nadir in reference to uh, uh, white cell counts? Uh, so, this is basically when you're looking at, if you were looking at a white cell count for a patient, over time, you're going to find that, say, you start out at a normal level and you give the cancer uh, the um, uh, chemotherapy, you're going to say that it'll go down and it's going to dip. And eventually, at some point, you're going to get hit to a, kind of the bottom point of it, and then the patient can then recover, okay? This is called the nadir right here, or nadir, however you want to pronounce it. Um, that's the lowest point that they're going to be hitting as far as their neutrophil counts are going to go. Um, this is important to know because, again, if this goes down to, say, zero, what happens? Patient gets an infection and they probably die, right? Because again, they just have no no um, uh, immune system to really kind of fight back against that. So again, this is why it can be possibly fatal. Okay, this one's important because usually you see the the nadir pretty quick, say uh, a couple days to a week or so. This one can be delayed by four to six weeks, right? So it's not you're worried about the myelosuppression for your patient right then, but four to six weeks later, you can find that they need to be monitoring those white blood cell counts to make sure they're not going to develop an infection, right? So it lasts up to two weeks. It's a long time for a patient to really not have a whole lot of good uh, functioning immune system. What type of antibiotics would I want to use for someone who is neutropenic? Side, you know, bactericidal, bacteriostatic, bactericidal. Remember, because good, you want to use something that's going to be able to directly kill those cells or the bacterial cells versus something that's just going to inhibit it because I don't have a good immune system to fight that off. Good. Yes, sir. Basically, it's that bottom point. It's a, uh, at what point you hit the bottom point of your uh, your neutrophil count before you start to recover. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, if I were to give you know BC and U, I may have to wait four to six weeks. For other drugs, I may only have to wait a few days or a week or so before I get to that bottom point. It's the bottom of that valley there before you get, the patient can start to recover on their own. That could be the case. Yeah, absolutely. So you could see it where, um, in that case, you may have to wait even longer. So maybe several months between treatments where you'll give the drug, you wait for them to kind of hit their nadir, and then you're going to see how they recover. You may be giving them things to try to help stimulate their own white blood cell count on their own, right? So we have things, um, we have colony stimulating factors we can administer to help speed that recovery up. And then we can wait for them to get to a certain point, and then we go ahead and give them another round of treatment, right? So we have very frequently, we'll have patients will come into our infusion center, and they'll be there ready to get their chemotherapy, and they get their counts done. They say, well, you don't make counts. You got to go home. It kind of stinks from the patient's standpoint because they came in for nothing, but you have to do those labs beforehand because you want to make sure they don't have a kind of overwhelming uh, immunosuppression. Yeah, so it can be a big thing to, to monitor for. Okay. Anyway, uh, up next we have the platinum analogs. Now, these are for patients who have really good insurance, right? I want to say platinum for the best. Just kidding. Um, so uh, this includes things like cisplatin, carboplatin, and then oxaloplatins. We see platinum in the name, then you know it's going to be a platinum-based uh, uh, sort of um, alkylating agent here. Okay, So this one is basically going to be causing the same sort of um, alkylations here for the actual nucleotides to cause damage, but you also can find a lot of uh, strand uh, linking that happens here. So you can either have these kind of inter-strand uh, cross-links, which you can see where it happens between either 
one of the strands of the DNA, or you may have an intra-strand adduct where actually you're going to have binding within the same strand of DNA, right? The end result is the same. Our purpose is we just need to know is causing alkylation of the DNA, causing damage further leading to apoptosis, right? Um, now, no, things to note here, this one definitely causes nephrotoxicity. This is one of the big ones that causes significant nephrotoxicity. Not the same as with cyclophosphamide and ifosfamide, right? That was more bladder toxicity. This is nephrotoxicity, and the other thing you're going to see is ototoxicity, right? What other drugs did that combo? Vancomycin, aminoglycosides, right? Those are the big ones cause oto and nephrotoxicity. Lasix could be potentially causing some of that as well, not as much, but um, here you can see that uh, these are going to do that as well. Um, also, vigorous hydration is really important here, right? So again, this is another one of those adjuvant sort of therapies you'd be administering is a lot of fluid before, during, and after they receive the chemotherapy to make sure they're flushing everything through and they can eliminate that much faster, okay? Um, Again, there's a risk for hypersensitivity. Anaphylaxis is always going to be a risk here. And then uh, severe nausea and vomiting. You'll find that not every chemotherapeutic drug is the same as far as it causing nausea and vomiting. Some will be considered to be pretty minimal sort of risk. Some are going to be very, very high risk. And you kind of have to change your treatment accordingly. So for some patients, anyone ever heard of the drug Zofran? Most people have probably heard of Zofran before. Right? It's a very like tried and true gold standard sort of antiemetic. Most patients get that. If you go to the ER, complain of nausea and vomiting, you're going to get some Zofran. They practically have it on like a, in a big like 55 um, gallon drum. They just give it to every patient as they come through, right? Um, you know, for some drugs like say vincristine, it's a very minimal sort of nausea and vomiting. You know, you just need some Zofran, it'll be fine. Uh, for some of these other drugs like platinum analogs, you're going to re be receiving Zofran. They're going to be getting uh, corticosteroids. They're going to be getting um, Ativan. I mean, all a whole litany of drugs to try to prevent that nausea and vomiting. So just know that you have to change your regimen based on how severe the nausea vomiting is going to be here. Now, again, I'm not going to ask you on a test which one only takes Zofran versus which one requires more. That's not really where we're at at this point, right? We'll cover those antiemetics in the GI section next semester, but just know that it's kind of a spectrum here, right? Not all of these are going to be uh, uh, kind of made the same. Uh, a couple other alkylators, things like decarbazine, timazolamide. Again, these are going to be working um, to, to, again, bind up that DNA, cause strand damage, cause eventual apoptosis to occur here. Again, again a lot of significant myelosuppression, alopecia, vomiting. Uh, this one here, busulfan, is kind of interesting uh, mainly because it's kind of main claim to fame. Uh, if you ever hear busulfan lung, this one's very well noted to cause um, pulmonary fibrosis, right? So you have to be careful with that. Um, any of the alkylating agents cause pulmonary fibrosis, but this one in particular tends to be a little bit worse there. Bleomycin is another one uh, can do as well, but busulfan is a big one here, okay? Okay. So those are kind of your traditional sort of chemotherapeutic drugs, right? So again, know the mechanisms, know any kind of unique toxicities, go back to chemo man to figure that out. Um, look at drug interactions potentially, you know, think about if I have a patient who's developing fluid retention from being on docetaxel, what can I give to treat that, right? Because we're not covering diuretics specifically on this test doesn't mean they're not gonna come back up. Actually we are, because we're talking about CHF and all kinds of stuff, but you, know, you still have to re remember these drugs, okay? Going into uh, some other therapies. So uh, first off, we have hormonal therapies. When do you think these might be useful? It's a big one you think about hormones causing a cancer, maybe in female patients. Breast cancer, right? Breast cancer is a big one, right? We know estrogens and androgens. Are they anabolic or catabolic steroids? They're anabolic. They're building things up, right? You know, they're not catabolic like a glucocorticoid would be. But um, you're going to find uh, that specific types of cancers can be more or less sort of hormone sensitive, right? So again, depending on the type of mutations they have, what type of receptors they're expressing, um, you know, things like prostate cancer can be uh, big, playing a big role. Things like testosterone, right? Um, breast cancer with estrogen. So all these are going to be uh, looking at you know, different therapies to try to treat this either by blocking the effects, maybe preventing conversion of one product to another. We'll go over some examples here in just a second. As I mentioned, corticosteroids are very good from the fact that we can try to um, have their lymphotoxic effects, try to uh, inhibit their immune system, try to knock that down. It can be really good for leukemias. As I mentioned, also use this for nausea and vomiting. You know, any of these are fine. Prednisone, dexamethasone, they're all, they're all fine there. And so, again, how are these hormonal therapies going to work? Well, where do steroids typically work? At the nucleus, right? They're actually changing gene transcription. They're changing protein production. They're very potent in what they do because they get down to the nucleus and they're kind of working from the top of the pyramid down. Um, so very, very important from that standpoint because they're going to be working on things like gene expression, growth uh, promoters, things like that. Um, and so you're going to find that if you can block these effects, you know, hopefully block the production of these new cancer cells, right? So again, if I have an estrogen-sensitive breast cancer and I block the effects of estrogen, guess what? You don't have that, that same growth factor there. You're not going to have that same impetus for the cells to, to replicate. 
So um, as I mentioned, uh, hormonal therapy, typically you're going to find that we're trying to regulate this either by inhibiting the effects. Usually that's what we're going to see is by inhibiting that. Um, as I mentioned, glucocorticoids are going to be more kind of suppressing that, that immune system there. Antiestrogens, it's good for things like breast cancer, or cervical cancer, et cetera. And then antiandrogens, typically used a lot for things like you know, uh, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. So just to give you a couple examples, and some of these we'll talk more about when we get into specific um, urology stuff and, and ob later on, but just an example, uh, one called tamoxifen. This is what we call a estrogen partial agonist or a selective estrogen receptor modulator. If you ever see that, it's what that stands for, a CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modulator. What do, you, what do you think that means? Well, are all estrogen receptors built the same? No, the ones that are expressed in the breast tissue can be different than the ones expressed in the endometrial tissue can be different than the ones expressed in the bone, right? Is estrogen important for bone growth development? 100%, right? If you lose estrogen, say you have a postmenopausal woman, what happens to her bones? The osteoporotic, absolutely. So um, these are going to be drugs that can act as antagonists in certain tissues, but agonists in other tissues. So a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's selective in which ones it's going to be modulating, right? Modulating is just a fancy way of saying either turning it on, turning it off, inhibiting it activating it, whatever. Um, so you're going to find that some of these drugs are going to work as an antagonist in the breast tissue, but it work as an agonist in other places, right? Because again, if I were to give you something that blocks all estrogen effects throughout the female body, what happens basically? It's like you're giving a menopause, right? Because again, that's essentially what menopause is, is your uh, lack of estrogen production. Same thing can happen, which is not great Great from a side effect profile, from a, you know a cardiovascular profile, from a bone profile, and things like that. So um, again, this may be one we give to patients with, say, estrogen uh, responsive breast cancer, right? So, especially if they have like a family history of it. Now, as you might imagine, if I'm blocking those receptors, what side effects could I see? As I mentioned, you're kind of putting them into menopause, uh, sort of. So you can see things like hot flashes, right? My mom likes to call them power surges. I like, I like that positive uh, spin on it. Um, you know, you can see things like DVT, like deep vein thrombosis can occur here from the, the uh, wherever it's acting as an agonist there. Pulmonary embolism, right? Um, in this case, it's actually linked to endometrial cancer because it's acting as an agonist in the endometrial tissue, but an antagonist in the breast tissue, okay? So again, you're gonna find this positive and negative effects kind of on either end of that, wherever it's working at. And positive estrogenic effects on the bone and cholesterol, they'll be good from a cardiovascular, from a, a musculoskeletal sort of standpoint. Uh, another one, uh, another type of serum, this one's actually, uh, tamoxifen was kind of the first one we had. Next we have raloxifene. Um, this one is actually going to be working more as a, an agonist in the bone, the cardiovascular system. Um, it actually is an antagonist in the breast and in the uterine tissue as well. And so again, just a little different flavor there. Um, we use this a lot for osteoporosis, or specifically where we want to try to uh, limit the estrogen effects on, say, the breast tissue and the uterine tissue, but we still want to have the positive sort of bone effects, uh, especially for all those postmenopausal older uh, sort of women. Um, this one is called a uh, fulvestrant. This is a selective estrogen receptor down regulator, or SIR. This one is usually used for more refractory cases of breast cancer. Um, this one is a pure anti-estrogen, so a lot of side effects associated with it, a lot of negative metabolic side effects associated with it, but it can be useful if you've kind of failed other therapies. If your breast cancer is tending to be resistant, despite the fact um, that you were on one of those SIRMs before, basically you can just go and have just a pure anti-estrogen effect and that can sometimes be effective. Uh, next, we have anostrozole and letrozole. These are actually going to be aromatase inhibitors. Anyone remember what aromatase does? That's one of those things that helps to convert things like testosterone over into eventually turning into estrogen, right? So again, aromatase is an important enzyme for estrogen production. So if I can block that effect, basically it's going to try to um, prevent new estrogen production. Of course, what might you see? You have more kind of masculinizing sort of effects that occur for these women, there, right? So you see differences in hair growth, uh, muscular pain associated with this. Um, some cases, these are actually replacing some of the older drugs we have, like tamoxifen. So again, just trying to give you kind of a cursory glance of seeing the different options we have here, different um, modalities we might try to target, um, rather than just giving a pure, you know, drug that's going to just bind up the DNA and cause a ton of damage here. Uh, this is another one called exemestane. This is actually an irreversible aromatase inhibitor, so much more potent, dropping down estrogen levels like 90% or so. So a lot of side effects associated with it, very effective for more um, treatment-resistant sort of uh, cancers. And here's just a couple of examples of anti-androgens. So these would be good for things like uh, prostate cancer or, say, for instance, you know, testicular cancer, like flutamide, nilutamide, and bicalutamide. So what sort of uh, side effects would you expect to see from an anti-androgen uh, sort of drug? 
probably some more feminizing sort of effects. So kind of similar to what we saw with like spironolactone. Remember, gynecomastia was a big thing here. You'll see that here as well. Um, Sometimes given with some other drugs is where you can use combination therapies uh, to try to get better effects out of it. But these are ones that would be anti-androgen, so blocking the effects of testosterone. And also with some more potent form of testosterone. Yeah, DHT, dihydrotestosterone as well. That one's very important as well. Uh, next you have luperide and gazarelin. These are actually analogs of gonadotropin releasing hormones. Where do these work? The pituitary, hypothalamus. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. These are going to be yeah, working on the anterior pituitary. Remember, this is typically released by the hypothalamus to uh, stimulate secretion of things like what? LH, FSH, right? So this is a big uh, gonadotropin so we, we talked about previously. So this is kind of interesting because these are going to actually, um, in lower doses, can actually stimulate production of LH and FSH, which can eventually produce uh, what type of hormones? Estrogen, progestin, or, uh, progesterone, testosterone, right? All of those get produced, uh, the effects of LH and FSH. But if I give too much of it, right, you can actually start to cause that negative feedback loop to actually be activated, right? And so you can actually end up causing a desensitization and ultimately will inhibit the release of FSH and LH, okay? So again, depending on the dose, you may either see a stimulation or a complete shutdown of the whole system there, which can be good if you had more estrogen or testosterone sort of dependent tumors there. Okay, so just a couple of examples of different hormonal agents you may be using. Uh, next, we have our biologic response modifiers. So again, these are nice because these are actually very specific towards particular types of cells, right? Or only certain mutations, only certain type of receptors. And so if you guys remember way back in the pharmacodynamic days, remember we were so young back then, right? Uh, remember the tyrosine kinase receptors we talked about? So this particular uh, type of receptor it wasn't G protein, it wasn't an ion channel, but it was a tyrosine kinase. You can go back there. Remember when they get activated, remember they dimerize and they get phosphorylated and they have whatever downstream effect. Um, these are actually going to be drugs that are specifically targeting these protein kinases. And there's a lot of them that humans express, you know, over 550 uh, different protein kinases uh, that we can code for. Um, so they're very, very important for that cell signal transduction uh, pathway, okay? Um, things like insulin receptors are important here, right? Things like epidermal growth factors, things like uh, platelet drive growth factors. We have lots of different varieties. And so we can have drugs that specifically target individual one of these. And by doing that, you get much more specific. So then instead of affecting every single cell we have out there, especially the rapidly dividing ones, we get more specific and only targeting, say, for instance, the cancer cells. So I'll show you a few examples of these. Again, here's a picture way back from pharmacodynamics. Remember, these are the inactivated form of the tyrosine kinase. It comes, it has a signal molecule, it binds to it. It will dimerize, it will then get phosphorylated, and then it has whatever cellular response you want to look for, right? So if it's, for instance, you know, producing new angiogenesis to try to get more blood flow to the tumor, things like that, that can all be uh, playing a role. Again, it's very, very complicated as far as the cell, cell signaling pathway. Just know that by inhibiting these specific receptors, we can kind of shut all this stuff down. And so again, for specific types of cancers, you may find these can be very, very effective. So one uh, here that is seen, this is a myeloid tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So this one's called a matinib. Usually if you see a nib at the end of a drug name, typically it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. General rule of thumb. Um, and Gleevec was a, the uh, brand name here for this one. This is actually an oral agent. Again, there's not a ton of oral chemotherapy. You're going to see a lot of patients on, but this is one of those. Um, and this one was used for chronic myeloid, uh, myeloid leukemia. Notice here, it's a specific mutation. You had to have this BCR able mutation expression. And then if you had that, you uh, express a particular type of tyrosine kinase receptor that normal other healthy cells did not express or other types of CML did not express. And so again, this is laser targeted towards a very specific mutation that was more common for those patients that had CML. Or if they had this uh, EVT6 uh, PDGFR, like, you don't have to know those specifics, but just know that these are very specific, very targeted. Again, mutation-based even. So you'd have to test the patient, figure out what type of CML they have, what type of mutations they have by genotyping them, and then you can say, okay, this is a good drug for you. If you didn't have the mutation, the drug would be ineffective. Okay, But by doing that, by block, blocking those effects there, you're going to see less of these, uh, the less cell proliferation. And side effect-wise, it's not really that bad. Maybe a little amount of vomiting, but you don't see the overwhelming myelosuppression. You don't see the alopecia. Uh, maybe a little bit of edema, but nothing nearly as bad as a lot of the other chemotherapies. So from a side effect profile, very, very good from that standpoint. Much less risk for infection with the older, more traditional agents. Very, But, you know, it's not as, um, uh, you know, as wide ranging. I can use vincristine for a lot of different types of cancers. This is very specific for that one particular type of mutations, right? 
Uh, another example here is a jafitinib, uh, sometimes used for non-small cell lung cancer. Again, pretty mild from the side effect profile, but again, very specific for that type of cancer. Just even though these are biologic response modifiers, they're not actually biologic drugs themselves. You notice here they're very typical sort of organic chemistry structures, not anything protein-based, uh, as we'll see here in a few minutes here. Uh, here's one that affects the HER1 uh, receptor. Again, this could be uh, erlotinib. And some of these may be a little bit more wide-ranging. This one could be used for certain lung, uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancers, head and neck cancers, pancreatic. So uh, some of them are very laser-focused. Some of them might be a little bit more broad spectrum. It just depends on the drug. Uh, just another example of lapatinib. A lot of these are oral, which is very nice from a patient compliance sort of standpoint. Um, this one can be used for things like uh, metastatic breast cancer. Um, again, you can still use these in combination with other drugs, right? You can still try to get some synergy from using these along with more traditional chemotherapy to get better cell kill uh, for those patients there. Okay. Uh, up next, we have our biologic response modifiers that are uh, in the antibody sort of category here, right? So again, how do you know an antibody when you see it? Is a MAB at the end, right? MAB is monoclonal antibody here. So we have a lot of different uh, options here. Um, remember that, um, you know, are all of these based purely on human proteins? No, a lot of them are coming from things like murine proteins. Murine just means mouse. So if you give these to your patients and they want some cheese afterwards, that's okay. It's normal, right? Just kidding. Um, if you ever see an X in there, that typically means it's chimer uh, chimeric. Uh, it's a combination of both mouse and human protein. What do you think that means as far as anaphylaxis risk goes? going to go up. Well, it's less than if you had pure murine protein, right? Because again, anytime it's a foreign protein, the body recognizes it's foreign, it's going to be more likely to have uh, allergic reactions to it, right? So if I had something that was more humanized, usually if you see like a U on it, so uh, alumtuzumab um, is much more human-based sort of protein as far as the amino acid sequence goes, that is going to be less likely to have an allergic reaction, but you still have the chance. You have something chimeric, there's the X in there, it tends to have a little bit higher risk, okay? That just means you're going to be um, taking some appropriate precautions beforehand and pre-treating patients to make sure they don't have a reaction to it. We'll talk about that in a second. But here's some just examples. Again, you're finding new ones of these produced every single day practically. This is a huge uh, exploding market where they're producing very specific antibodies targeted against very specific either cell type receptors, you know, cell surface receptors particularly, growth factors, a lot of different examples. So I'm going to give you just a few here, some ones we may use a little bit more commonly. Um, and again, some of them have wide ranging ability or difficulty in saying their names. Some of them are easy, like rituximab. No problem, right? Some of the other ones we're going to see here in a few minutes are going to be a little bit more difficult. But just to give you an example, this one's a chimeric human murine antibody. This one's specifically targeting CD20, okay? So again, on the, there are certain B lymphocytes that will express CD20. This is then going to go in and target each one of those. Once it's targeted, once it's bound up, what happens to it? then your immune system can, can interact with it, right? Once it gets targeted by an antibody, your body's going to start activating like the complement system. It says, okay, we need to go ahead and get rid of this cell here, right? It's kind of targeting it uh, for further destruction. And so we're going to find that CD20 typically regulates cell cycle activation. And so by inhibiting this as well, you also try to inhibit that proliferation. You inhibit the cells from further uh, replicating, which is great. Um, as I mentioned, that complemented mediated lysis is also going to help with that apoptosis, getting rid of those cells, killing them off. And again, it kills off the cancer cells. Now these ones, uh, the antibodies typically have a longer duration of action, so typically you have to give them less frequently. So you may see these being given every month or so, uh, every few months or a couple of weeks, it just depends on the case here. Um, but as you mentioned, what are the side effects going to be? Usually you're going to find a lot of anaphylactoid or anaphylactic sort of reactions here. So you're going to see a lot of things like, you know, um, you know urticaria, infusion-related reactions, sort of myalgias, kind of fever-like symptoms, um, or flu-like symptoms, I should say. And so again, we can pre-treat this. So how would we pre-treat? these allergic sort of reactions? Steroids. steroids, yeah, so you can give steroids. What else can I give? How else do we treat allergic reactions? Anti Histamine, yeah, any histamine. So very frequently we'll give uh, these patients before they get rituximab, we get this pretty frequently, we will give them uh, acetaminophen, used for, what do you use that for, do you think? You get a flu, you get Beaver, right? Good, it's antipyretic. Good, help with some of the myalgias. What else? We can give antihistamines. We give Benadryl usually, and then we can give steroids. These are the three drug combination we'll give to these patients beforehand. And then also, what do we have at the bedside ready to go in case they have a true anaphylactic reaction? Epinephrine, right? So you always want to have an anaphylaxis kit ready for these patients because you never know when they might sensitize to it and have a reaction. So something to be careful of. And again, with these ones, um, what's a, another potential side effect? I'm inhibiting all these B lymphocytes. What could also happen? 
immunosuppression, right? So you got to be careful with these because if you're uh, inhibiting the immune system, you run the risk of developing infection, right? So again, oftentimes with a lot of these drugs, you also want to test for what before you start therapy? What latent infection might a patient have that could activate TB? Yeah, so a lot of these ones you're going to be wanting to test for TB beforehand. We'll see it a lot when you get into like, the rheumatologic drug, uh, the, the anti um, rheumatoid arthritis drugs and things like that later on. You want to really be careful with that because you can see um, you know, it's a mild, mild suppression. It's not as significant as you would see with, like, say, paclitaxel or something. Um, you're going to find that uh, it still you know, could lead to infection. Uh, another couple of examples of things like alemtuzumab. This one's actually specifically against uh, CD52. And again, um, just trying to illustrate the different targets we can have. Again, these are very specific. You're not going to see as wide-ranging a side effects as you would see normally with kind of the more traditional sort of chemotherapeutic agents, right? And again, infusion reactions, opportunistic infections. This has not changed uh, amongst any of these, right? Because again, they're all going to have some mild, mild suppression, some mild inhibition of in the immune system, and they're all going to have that protein base uh, to them, so they can all have a reaction. Uh, trastuzumab, this one's against a specific human epidermal growth factor, so this can be sometimes be used for um, certain types of uh, breast cancers. So uh, you can, again, use this in combination with other traditional chemotherapy, and they can get some synergy there. Um, but again, useful if they are expressing this HER2 oncogene. If they don't express that, then the drug's not going to be that effective if it can't really bind to it. It's a target for it to, to lock on to. I'm going to give you an example there using with things like doxorubicin, which you said is an anthracycline, and a taxane, which is working more on the um, uh, the microtubules there. So it's using multiple mechanisms here to try to get those cells uh, as best you can. Um, Again, very similar sort of side effects you're going to be seeing with this one, right? You know, a lot of infusion-related reactions there. Um, again, uh, this one's kind of unique because it causes a cardiomyopathy, rarely, usually more kind of prolonged sort of therapies. So one thing you want, might want to note, maybe an echo would be good for those patients. Uh, another one called cetuximab. Again, this is an epidermal growth factor receptor uh, bind to that. So again, good for certain types of colorectal cancer. And again, I'm not expecting you to memorize every single one of these MABs that are out there, but just kind of a, a, an idea of what are some of the, the, the kind of unique things, the kind of broad strokes of these like infusion reactions, right? Uh, know that you know they're very expensive compared to a lot of other drugs because they are proteins, knowing that you know they're very specific in their targets as opposed to a lot of the other traditional chemotherapeutic agents. Those are things that kind of want you to focus in on. I don't call bevacizumab or avastin. Again, this one's used for um, uh, sometimes a breast and lung cancer typically. Uh, this one's kind of interesting because it can cause a severe hypertension. Again, who knows why? Probably has to do with the fact that it's affecting the vascular endothelial growth factors. If you're inhibiting that, then perhaps you end up having some issues with uh, angiogenesis. You end up seeing some hypertension from that. Uh, CHF can be exacerbated here. So other kind of unique things with, with this particular drug. And then here's another one called uh, uh, LSPAR or DL asparaginase. This one's kind of interesting. So this is a, a different sort of mechanism than you saw with the other drugs here. Instead of being an antibody, this one's actually trying to um, uh, basically inhibit the ability for these cancer cells to develop a asparagine, right? Asparagine is just what? Yeah, it's an amino acid that typically you need to produce things like proteins, right? Um, basically, you're going to find that you need to uh, have the asparagine, right, for your protein synthesis to occur. Um, normal cells can actually produce their own asparagine, right? What you tend to find is that some of these lymphoid tumors actually have a uh, have very low level of this asparagine synthetase. Um, so they have to take it up. They already made asparagine from outside of the cells, okay? Well, if I can inhibit that, if I can give something like asparaginase, I can help to deplete that asparagine. Healthy cells can still produce it their own cells, but cancer cells could not. And so that way you lead to eventual, uh, you know, decrease in protein production, eventual cell death in that case. So it's kind of a unique sort of take here where you try to spare the normal healthy cells, but you're kind of more specifically targeting uh, as a kind of secondary effect the, the cancer cells. In a couple of different places, you're going to see this being used. We use it for some uh, types of ALL. Um, we see it in some of our pediatric patients. And again, usually using combination with other chemotherapeutic agents there. Um, still uh, a protein-based product here and still going to cause allergic reactions. You got to be careful with that. Um, and then some other kind of ancillary things, things like intracranial hemorrhage, very low risk, but still a risk to think about. Um, you know, risk for bleeding by de uh, depleting clotting factors, ammonia toxicity. So lots of kind of ancillary effects due to the effects it has on asparagine and depleting that body-wide. Okay, um, so we have two minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and, and we'll cover the rest of this on our last class session. We'll then have the review afterwards, and then you'll be done with Farm 1. You'll successfully, well, almost successfully completed. After Monday, you'll have successfully completed Pharmacology 1. You should be very proud of yourselves once you get to that point. No clapping yourselves on the back just yet. Let me check.